Before you become a World Chess Champion, you have to become a World Chess Championship Challenger. Mikhail Tal earned that right in 1959 in the Candidates Tournament. In addition to winning the tournament with a point and a half more than the field, he also won the Brilliancy Prize for this fantastic game against former world champion Vesely Smyslov. The game opens with a Karo Khan defense, one of Smyslov's trusted weapons, and already on move 2 we get something different. Tal plays pawn to d3. In his own words, this is not an attempt to get a large opening advantage, but instead just an attempt to get something new. Smyslav responds, of course, with pawn to d5, and after knight d2, pawn to e5, establishing a big center, we get knight to f3. At this point, we get knight to d7, which proves to be a bit of a mistake. Instead, a sturdier way to support the center was bishop to d6. This move looks to me a little unappealing because you stick the bishop behind the pawn on e5 where it's a little bit blocked in, but this is a very effective way to support the center and black is very sturdy right here. Instead, knight d7 allows Tal a big opportunity. Tal strikes in the center of the board with pawn to d4. I think that this is a move that is easy to miss. You've put the pawn on d3, you're not likely to consider pushing it again as early as move 5. However, with this move, the position is opening up unavoidably, and after the opening of the position, we have a position where you have three pieces developed to one from black, and the knight on d7 isn't doing a lot, and the pawn on c6, which is such a helpful support to the center in the Karo Khan defense, is actually not very well placed. You no longer have a center to support after these exchanges, and your d6 square is weak as well. Smyslav develops with knight to f6, and Tal develops and pins that knight with bishop g5. After bishop e7, this was actually a great opportunity to consider knight d6 check. Black is forced to give up the bishop pair, and although he can survive by now entering an endgame with knight to e4 when the two attacked queens must be traded, it's still a very nice endgame for white. However, Smyslav was great at endgames, and it's not exactly what Tal was famous for at this point, so you can understand that Tal instead chose to castle instead of playing knight d6 check. He keeps more pieces on the board and escalates the tension. Smyslav goes ahead and castles, and now Tal does decide to drop his knight into d6. Maybe pawn to h4 was actually a better way to develop an initiative and play in an aggressive tile kind of style. However, after knight d6, Smyslav had some opportunities. He could have played knight d5, looking to ease the pressure on this diagonal. After some exchanges here, we're going to find that the knight on d6 is actually not well supported by any pawns or the white pieces, and black is in a good position to try to equalize the game. This is exactly the kind of thing that Smyslav would have looked to do as black. However, in this game, he didn't go for it. Instead, after the knight hopped into d6, he picked the sharpest move. He plays queen to a5. Now, this is a very interesting move in which black is trying to get an initiative on the queen side to compensate for white's active pieces. You have kings castled on opposite sides of the board, and that generally means that both players should be as aggressive as possible. However, this is a position where aggression is going to favor white. There's simply a lot more activity in the white camp and a lot more ways for black to go wrong. Tal responds with the simple bishop to c4 here, which develops the last minor piece and protects the pawn on a2. We get pawn to b5, and this is a nice move. If the bishop simply falls back here, then pawn c5 hits the queen, and after the queen moves, the bishop on b3 does get trapped, so Smyslav has totally turned the tables. However, after bishop to c4, pawn to b5 here, we don't get bishop back to b3, Tal is ready, and at this point he plays bishop d2. In his own words, Tal says that this is a very important intermediate move, and the main aim is to free the square g5. It can be used both by the knight or by the queen, as actually happens in the game. After bishop d2, the attacked black queen falls back to a6, and now we get knight to f5, gaining time on the bishop on e7. It falls back to d8. One interesting option was bishop to c5, trying to swing the bishop out to a square where it's attacking the queen, and hoping after the queen moves to capture this bishop on c4. 
However, a peace sacrifice is now very good for white, and after the queen retreats and black accepts the peace sacrifice, then bishop c3 in conjunction with queen to g5 is a tremendous attack for white, actually a winning attack, although we won't get too deep into all the variations. So Smyslav instead did pull that bishop back to d8. Tal now did play possibly the most famous move in the game, but I want to mention the possibility of knight takes g7 before we dive into the game continuation. Knight takes g7 is actually really interesting and pretty dangerous. However, it looks like it's only good enough for a half point. Black does better not to take the knight and instead to capture this bishop over here. Now bishop c3 uh, creates a ton of pressure on this diagonal right here, but black can just take everything that white is offering, and white's attacking pieces only get enough for a draw. Here, you can unleash the rook sacrifice on d7 to remove the defender of f6, but you just don't have a way to successfully include these pieces, so your queen has to finish the job alone, and that means it's only a draw by perpetual check. Instead, what Tal did was he played the move queen to h4. This is kind of a quiet move. You're not capturing anything and you're not making an immediate threat. You're offering the bishop on c4 for a ton of significant threats to come up, but you didn't make one on this move. Smyslov does accept the sacrifice bishop here on c4, and now the point is queen g5. We're threatening mate on g7, and there's not a lot of ways for Smyslav to respond. For example, knight e8 just hangs the bishop on d8 because you interrupted the rook's defense of the bishop. g6 was actually a pretty good response, though I understand why Smyslav didn't go for this. It's very hard to advance this pawn and weaken your dark squares when white's already attacking them. However, analysis does show that black can hold on after bishop c3, queen takes a2, which creates a lot of counterplay. And after knight h6, king g7, and knight h4, which looks pretty threatening, there's a lot of big sacrifices that could come, black can actually hold here with a few different moves, including a crazy move knight e5 that I'm not going to analyze in detail here, but also moves like knight to c5 in this position. One important point is that the knight can hop to undefended squares because this knight over here is hanging, so if the queen captures, then the knight will still be safe. And of course, black has counterplay here as well, but the position is incredibly, incredibly sharp. So you can understand why Smyslav didn't go for a continuation like this, where maybe he's holding on, but it requires computer analysis, and you really don't trust your dark squares to hold together. Instead, he tried the last option to defend the g7 square. He played knight h5, which defends right here, and if the queen captures on h5, you've lost the threat of mate over here, and black gets counterplay with queen takes a2 in this position. Now you obviously have ideas of queen a1 check. If bishop c3, which seems the most threatening move, black can actually respond with knight to f6. This is hitting the queen right here, and it's also attacking the knight on f5. When the knight on f5 is gone, then black uh, or white will have no more attack in this position. So after knight h5, Tal continues the attack here with knight to h6 check. Of course, this pawn is pinned, so the king must step over to h8. Tal now does capture the knight on h5, and we have a really interesting decision. Now, Smyslav could have captured this knight on h6. It is a losing move, but it's important to consider why it actually loses. Here, bishop c3 check obviously creates a ton of pressure on this diagonal, Black doesn't really have a better choice than pawn to f6, and now queen takes h6 is creating a lot of pressure right here. The biggest immediate threat is just to take the knight on d7 and then take the rook on f8 with checkmate. There's also ideas like knight g5 because this pawn is pinned, that would create a huge mate threat on h7. So rook g8 seems to make the most sense. You're covering g5 so the knight can't hop in there, or at least you could consider taking it if it does hop in, and also... Um, in this position, you're avoiding the capture on d7 and then the loss of the rook because you move the rook. Now, there's a lot of ways to win. For example, knight g5 is good enough because after the rook takes, the queen can just take. But the way that I love is rook h to e1 here. I always love including all of the pieces in the attack here. Here, the threats are overwhelming. 
Queen b5 is the best try that black has, trying to use the queen to defend along this fifth rank. And now an amazing move is rook to e5. I mean, this is a drop the mic amazing move that would be, you know, eternally remembered in the chess annals. At this point, basically, black cannot hold together this diagonal. The queen is hit, and also there's threats of rook h5, among many, many other threats. So let's say that black does capture here on e5. Now you sacrifice the exchange on d7 so that you can take here. Black is up two rooks in this position, but there's no way to save the game. In fact, black can even win the white queen with bishop to g5 check, and now you do not take. Instead, you simply step out of the way with king b1, and after you lose the queen, you can pick between two double checks and mates right here. Absolutely stunning line. Again, there are other ways to win, but that's just amazing, and I had to show that. So back to the game. After queen takes h5, realizing that he couldn't take the knight on h6, Smyslav tried queen takes a2. He is threatening mate right here, so Tal does need to respond very, very carefully. Of course, the most natural move that he plays is bishop to c3, which gives the king a flight square here on d2 and creates more threats here and pins the pawn so it can't capture the knight anymore. After bishop c3, Smyslav had his last opportunity to hold the game. He had to, in this position, play bishop f6. Now, Tal can continue attacking with, for example, knight g5 here, and he does get some advantage, but the game remains really complicated, and there's no way to immediately break down Smyslav's position. Uh, he is holding this long diagonal together. Instead, after the bishop stepped to c3, Smyslav played the knight to f6 instead of the bishop to f6. Smyslav's main point must be that knight takes f7, seemingly the most threatening move in the position, actually doesn't work. After king g8, Tal would just be overextended with too many pieces hanging and no follow-up in this position. However, that is not what Tal had prepared, and you must believe that Smyslav had just missed the next thunderous move. Tau plays queen takes f7 in this position. The queen hops to a seemingly defended square, but if you capture, you're actually getting back rank checkmated. You can only throw a few pieces in the way, and after, for example, knight blocks, you get a checkmate here where these pieces are in perfect coordination. Because of that, after queen takes f7, there's really nothing to do but resign. You cannot save this position. However, Smyslav does postpone that resignation for a little while. He starts with queen a1 check, but after king d2, the black queen is just hanging here even though you've managed to interrupt the rook's attack on d8. A major problem is that after queen takes d1 here and then rook takes d1, you have a sting in the tail of the combination. At the end, there's a fork right here and Tal would just go up a piece. Instead, Smyslav tries rook takes f7 here, but after knight takes check king over, rook takes a1, Tal is up an exchange, he picks off a pawn here on c6, and at this point in the game, Smyslav resigns. I think that the move number is significant here because this is move number 26. If Smyslav had resigned before this, Tal would have won in 25 moves or less, that's famously known as a miniature in chess. No great player likes to lose a miniature and see that publicized everywhere, so Smyslav was probably hoping that by continuing the game a little bit, he might avoid that indignity. Unfortunately, the game still won a brilliancy prize and has been widely celebrated, so Smyslav did not escape some level of infamy, for lack of a better word, for this game. I hope that you've enjoyed the game as much as I've enjoyed showing it. If so, please do like and subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of future videos. And there's a playlist sitting on the board with more incredible games from Tal.